to welcome you to the University of Texas and to the 11th Annual National Symposium on Law and Public Policy, uh, titled The Legacy of the Federalist Papers. We're happy to have you. Um, if I can make two brief administrative remarks. I noticed that a lot of us are seated at the end of these aisles. Um, and in light of the fact that we have a lot of people coming in late, I wondered if we couldn't encourage you to move to the middle. Um, just so there'll be seats at the end of the aisles, it'll be a lot harder for people coming in late to get to the middle. Uh, if you have a second, just go ahead and move in now. The other thing I'd like to, to make uh, an announcement about is we have uh, a little bit of a difficulty that will be coming up with returning many of the guests from the guest quarters suites hotels to your hotels later on tonight. We had initially planned to have shuttle vans uh, running from here to the hotel, and that has uh, that, that plan has collapsed. But, <laughs> But we will have arrangements to shuttle you back to the hotel. Uh, the officers and some of the other members will be uh, offering some carpooling. So if I could just ask those uh, guests of the guest quarter suite hotels, people staying in the host hotel, to gather in the lobby at the back of the stage, I'm sorry, at the back of the theater, at the end of the panel, we will help arrange the return trips and uh, get everything organized. So sorry about that inconvenience. Hopefully by tomorrow, the logistics will be uh, smoothed out a little bit. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Dean, or Associate Dean Doug Laycock. Uh, he, is, he holds the Alice McKeon Young Regents Chair and is Associate Dean for Research at the University of Texas. Dean Laycock. I'm not the one the applause is supposed to be for. Welcome uh, to the University of Texas and to the first week of spring in Central Texas. We're glad to have you here. I'm standing in for the real dean, Mark Udoff, uh, as we call him, the high dean, or the dean of deans. Uh, he is doing something tonight, believe it or not, even more important to the law school than the annual meeting of the Federal Society. Uh, I think that means, I assume and hope it means, that he's out raising money, uh, which is uh, one of the many things he does. Um, I told my class in constitutional law that they should come to this event, that they would learn much, that someone might mention a question on the exam. Uh, and I also told them uh, that on Monday afternoon, uh, Nadine Strassen, the national president of the ACLU, will be here. And, and I said that this illustrated the debate over campaign finance laws, that the left could afford to bring in one star speaker and that the right could afford to bring in this whole constellation. Uh, and, uh, I'm pleased to introduce the introducer of the first uh, constellation, uh, Chief Justice uh, Tom Phillips uh, of Texas. Uh, Chief Justice, uh, despite not graduating from the University of Texas Law School, uh, will let a Harvard man in, and uh, we're, uh, we're pleased to have him here, and he will introduce the other speakers. Mr. Chief Justice. Thank you, Dean Lightfoot. On behalf of uh, somebody, I guess the Supreme Court of Texas and the lawyers of the state of Texas, it is a great pleasure to welcome all of you to the University of Texas, to our capital city of Austin, uh, and to this great state. We are most pleased that the Federalist Society has chosen to hold its 11th annual symposium on law and public policy here in Austin, Texas, at the flagship university of our state. And we hope that you will find your stay enjoyable, uh, exciting, and intellectually stimulating. I know that you'll want to attend all of these sessions. They all uh, appear to be marvelous, but I hope you'll have some time to uh, enjoy some of the culinary and cultural delights of uh, our great city of Austin, Texas. I am the moderator of the first panel discussion, uh, which is uh, indeed an honor for me, and it's going to be uh, exciting. I noticed in uh, some of the publicity of this event that uh, it was said I was going to make a speech, so I duly prepared a short speech. And then tonight, when I got to the law school, uh, there were a bunch of blue signs around that said, are the Federalist Papers still relevant? And it didn't seem to me that the opening moderator of the opening panel should answer the question that the whole two days are designed uh, to uh, settle. And so I will dispense with my remarks uh, and proceed to this very distinguished panel, uh, who will not spend all their time lecturing, but uh, hopefully no more than half the allotted time, so that there will be uh, ample opportunity for questions 
and exchange and interchange. We do have one unfortunate uh, uh, situation uh, with one of the panelists. Professor Michael S. Moore, University of Pennsylvania, has had a death in his family uh, and so has been unable to join uh, the symposium this year. We're very fortunate, though, that Professor Hal Ruff from right here at the University of Texas uh, was both intellectually able and uh, capable and uh, willing to come and substitute at the last moment. And so Professor Bruff, who teaches here at the university, will make the initial remarks uh, and will talk generally on the topic of the nature of man in the Federalist Papers. Hal? I hope that means it is the law of Texas that I will be capable of doing this. In a museum in Philadelphia, you can still see an object that the framers gazed at in some wonder and awe. It is called an orrery. It is a mechanical model of the solar system. And to them, what it did was to render concrete Newtonian physics. They just loved it. I think it is an apt symbol for what I want to talk about tonight in three ways. First, it symbolizes the symmetry of the Federalist Papers themselves, crafted as they were to provide a coherent theory for what actually is the product of a rather rowdy democratic process of collective choice. Secondly, it stands as symbol for the government the framers constructed with its nice balances, uh, the things that fascinate me in my own work on separation of powers. And third, it stands as symbol, too, for the main focus of my remarks with you tonight, the adjustment of centripetal and centrifugal forces within human nature that the framers perceived and that they discussed in the Federalist Papers. Not surprisingly, I will say that I think their view, considering the orrery as symbol, was that these matters were both ultimately balanced and quite complex. As for balance, on the one hand, we all know that Madison famously remarked that we are not angels uh, and therefore need government. Hamilton, for his part, was quite fond of quoting an aphorism of Hume's to the general effect that in constructing government we must suppose each person a maid. And yet at the same time, on the other hand, the concept of public virtue was real to these people. They could, without any sign of embarrassment that I can detect, sculpt their heroes in togas. I think Washington looks especially silly that way. They also thought that the process of government could throw off, as our governors, the best characters. The Continental Congress had, the Constitutional Convention had. These people were, after all, themselves and they had, waiting in the wings for ratification, the man who would be twice unanimous in the Electoral College. So reason for optimism there was too. In Federalist 76, I think Hamilton captures the essence of their thought on this, at least on the surface, quite well by saying that suppositions of universal venality in people are as wrong as suppositions of universal rectitude. Well, their view of the Constitution was one of essentially social me mechanics. They thought that the institutions they were creating could develop the best in us, along with devices to, quote, supply the defect of better motives. In other words, hope for the best, but provide guarantees to make life, as one wag said, easier for the preacher. Here are the elements of human nature that the uh, that Publius discusses the most. There is some variety, but it falls into three main categories. The primary ones are passion, interest, and virtue. Passion meaning roughly emotion. Interest being rather like homo economicus, the rational pursuit of your own self-interest. And virtue being various things, but often a kind of a long-run enlightened self-interest. The problem they saw was that passion is worst, interest is somewhat better, and virtue is best, but they thought that in people and in people in general, these varied inversely in their power. 
that the passions were most powerful, virtue the least, and something needed to be done to deal with this. Indeed, they thought that groups in society mirrored this problem, that a few were wise and virtuous, they looked around at their friends, more still were at least prudent, but the masses were motivated by passion and immediate advantage. The implications for the politics of deference are fairly obvious. One thinks, for example, of the examples of wicked legislation uh, given us in Federalist 10, paper money, abolition of debt, equal division of poverty. Now, the framers also saw, Publius saw, that factious majorities had been greatly at the heart of problems under the revolutionary state government. Those uncontrolled legislatures uh, had produced the kinds of wicked legislation that Madison refers to in number 10, and something needed to be done uh, both to obtain rulers who would be the best among us uh, and to find precautions to keep them virtuous once in office. There are in the general structure of the Federalist Papers two basic devices to harness our behavior, and they are, of course, the nature of representation and the structure of the federal government. I will not trouble you again with something you know, which is the essential argument of Federalist 10, that the size of our republic, standing Montesquieu on his, on his head, would aid formation of a sound republic rather than hamper it, because the greater variety of interests would one would hope, prove self-canceling. I think of this as the government as Cuisinart part of the theory. <laughs> Secondly, it's perhaps a little less well-known, Madison stressed as well, that the mechanics of representation could also try to help government transcend special interest. He thought, for example, that a representative government would avoid an ethical or conflict of interest problem that direct democracies face, which is that we all wind up uh, being judges of our own cause. He thought that representatives could stand as rather disinterested arbiters um, among the competing claims. I would give you as an example of this how Dan Rostenkowski describes himself uh, a lot of the time. And the governors of the, that would emerge from this process would be among our betters. I might remark that when Madison referred, rehearsed this argument at the convention before putting it in the Federalist Papers, Hamilton said presciently, there is truth in these principles, but they do not conclude so strongly as he supposes. By the time they were all together as Publius, Hamilton, however, was on board. The other main technique, of course, in the structure of government. It was assumed by everyone that separation of powers was a good, and Madison didn't spend very much time or effort doing more than invoking the oracle Montesquieu, an oracle largely because he is often so difficult to, uh, to understand. And on he went toward, separate, toward checks and balances because that was the controversial part of his scheme. Uh, that, of course, blended some powers and went against received uh, received not wisdom in some ways. In looking at the checks and balances, and that is one of the main efforts of 47 through 51, 51 most notably, Madison was faced with the need to find a new basis for checks and balances, and he tied it to some of the perceptions in human nature uh, that the framers had. Older theories, mixed government theories, for example, had found checks in competing social classes, right? The aristocracy versus the monarchy and that sort of thing. We couldn't rely on mere parchment barriers to maintain the separation of the branches. Madison thought that state experience had proved that, and I think he's right. So instead, there were three basic ways that it was hoped um, that separation of powers and checks and balances would tend toward the public interest. First of all, recurring to multiple representation the idea was that repeated consideration of proposals, House, Senate, and President, would weed out passion, suppress the House of Representatives, I suppose, in part, and assure uh, mature consideration. Secondly, in the basic separation of powers, Publius would argue that the uh, particular institutions made and separated 
strengthen those parts of government that are associated with reason, the judiciary, take that Lino Braulio, the executive, <laughs> the Senate, and weaken the passionate parts of government, the House of Representatives, the state assemblies, uh, that sort of thing. And then finally, in the checks and balances, what's interesting to me there is what I think is the rhetorical core of Publius's argument in number 51 for the scheme of checks and balances with uh, the competing office holders, where he says that he means to let the private interest of each office holder be a sentinel over the public rights. It is this conversion of private motives of ambition and the like, where they are still operating uh, into sentinels for the public rights because of their offsetting nature, uh, that I think is at the core of the idea of checks and balances as Madison saw it. Now, in these brief moments, I have to stop there. I think that we can look at it overall and wonder for a moment at how it would be that Madison and Publius could have thought that a fractured government in a fractured society would lead to the kinds of civic virtue and public interest that were hoped for. Well, to explain it, I return to the concept of an orrery. Perhaps that what they, that's what they had in mind. When you first see it, everything is spinning, some slow, some fast, rather out of control. And when you look more closely, what you see, though, is every part is securely in its orbit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Brock. Our middle speaker is Professor Richard Epstein of the University of Chicago. And uh, I, uh, before I became Chief Justice, my last, perhaps my first uh, serious intellectual uh, effort outside of law school was a three-week seminar at the University uh, at Colorado College uh, in Colorado Springs where Richard Epstein entertained us and regaled us for three weeks on the, the origins of the American Constitution and the Federalist Papers. That's not his only subject. In fact, he's uh, taught nearly every subject in the law school curriculum. Uh, but he is here tonight as an expert in this area as well, uh, speaking to us uh, on the concept. Well, excuse me. He has a title speaking to us on From Human Nature to Constitutional Law. Richard Epstein. Actually, Tom is, or just, I can't say, Tom has actually told you a falsehood. Uh, when he was in Colorado College with me, it was he who regaled everybody with the down country and old boy stories. And I think that he's actually a past master with respect to that. And all I did was my usual boring sonorous academic number, which I will probably do tonight. Actually, I gave Tom this title, and while Hal was speaking, I'm not quite sure that I'm going to give the same speech that I started with, so that any relationship between the title and the talk, I think, will be seriously coincidental. And what I want to do is, is to basically take a somewhat different view of the Federalist Papers. One which, instead of treating this as a set piece, as this great tome of political theory, recognizes it for what it was. It was a document which was written on the great QT. Everybody was trying to hurry up to get out the next edition. They probably wrote Federalist 10 before they had written Federalist 50 and so on down the line. And they were trying with a particular purpose to persuade an audience to adopt a particular cause. And one effort of the great success that they had in their political message, it seems to me, was that they had been able to transform themselves through history 200 years later into this detached philosophical examination in which advocacy is no part of their purpose and chaos is no part of their original design. And it seems to me when you read the thing that, that in fact both elements are very much there. You would never have read the Federalist Paper today if it had simply been an idle track. But on the other hand, it would have never had quite the power it did unless it had a particular message that it wanted to get across. And well, how does this sort of ambivalence show itself? Well, I think one way is when you start the Federalist Paper and you ask this question about what's the nature of man that's associated with it, you'll look down and you see that the Federalist Paper is very much of two lines of minds. In the first paragraph, literally, of the document in Federalist 1, Hamilton puts to us the great choice that we have to face. 
And he says that this deliberation now means we have to decide whether societies can be constituted by reflection and choice or whether they're forever consigned to being the results of accident and force. So what you do is you have Alexander Hamilton and Federalist I coming out there as the world's perfect central planner. And what he's telling you, in effect, is that he can put together through great plans, great designs, sheer force of intellect, the kind of document which good men and women, using their rational faculties, can reasonably understand to be the one and only form. So the question is, who are these wonderful people who put it together? Well, they are the same kinds of people who presumably are the very individuals whom the Federalist Papers are trying to figure out how to curb once they attain power. So that you have a situation in which, to some extent, the authors of this document are of enormous virtue, and then they're the targets of the Constitution who are not individuals of the same stripe. And then there's this third group, the audience. And sure enough, if you go a little bit further in Federalist One, you find out that the process of deliberation does not end in Philadelphia, but it continues in New York, and that they will be good and considerate men who are able to understand all that's about to be said, and that therefore we now have a very clear account of human nature. It consists of individuals who, through collective deliberation, can come up with ideal documents. It consists of three brave souls who are able to transmit their wisdom, and it consists of a general public who is able to understand all of what they say. Now, what's the message that you get? Well, you then go down a couple of more pages, and it turns out that when you start to look at people, they fall into two classes, which covers exactly the same people in the first two. The first class of people it covers are people who have positions of power. And we are immediately warned that we have to be very suspicious of the fact of opposition to folks in state governments who stand to lose their power in emoluments if it turns out that this constitution will be passed. And then we are also told that this is another broad class of individuals, which more or less includes everybody, which is ruled by animus, greed, anxieties of one sort or another, and that the whole problem of passion and faction is so enormous. So that you have here the situation, in effect, where you are describing the entire body of human nature in two somewhat contradictory ways, and are doing so within the course of a very few pages. Now the question is, how do you try to get yourself out of this particular dilemma? Indeed, is there any way in which you can do it at all? And I don't think that there really is. I think that the essential point that one has to recognize about the Federalist Papers is that when they start to talk about the conception of man in the somewhat grandiloquent philosophical style, they really mean to put this in the plural, and that what they are trying to do is, in effect, to say that there are two components of the analysis that cannot be ignored. One of them is that when you're looking at individuals, there's an enormous variation in the kinds of people you're going to have, and that if you were to some individual virtues, the pluses and the minuses would not, not be the same with respect to all individuals. Some would come out on a much higher level than other individuals. There's a natural distribution of talent. So you've got the initial spread, but it's also very difficult in the initial setting to figure out exactly what's the center of gravity. How are you going to decide, in effect, to organize government so that more of the good sorts will get into power and fewer of the bad sorts will get there? And I think that one of the nice things about the account that is given in the Federalist Papers is they recognize that the distribution between good and bad is not something which is set once and for all by human nature, but is rather something which could shift and perhaps shift quite dramatically as a function of external events and the success and failures of government. So that you're constantly now in dealing with the creation of various kinds of legal structures, worried about the innate variability in individual human beings, and then once you've set up the initial distribution, you're worried about how it is that that will slide either to the right or to the left, move you to periods of relative calm and tranquility on the one hand, but perhaps move you to alternative periods in which there'll be massive destruction on the other. Now, setting out the problem in this particular way strikes me as exactly the right way in which to do the thing. That is, you, you make an assumption that everybody's going to be engaged in remorseless self-interest all the time, then it seems to me that reflection and choice will never yield any set of constitutional structures which will do better than any others. And on the other hand, if you assume that this deliberation and choice can be so powerful, then there really will be no problem at all. Because if individuals are that benign and that self, rather other regarding in the way in which they engage in their private and political actions, then it doesn't make the slightest bit of difference what form of constitutional structures that you have. So they set out this basic arrangement, and then what they're trying to do is to figure out what is it that's going to make the difference when you run the analysis. And what's quite striking is that they are no longer free agents. This is a political document to prove or to examine the wide range of circumstances that might be relevant to this particular choice. In the early part of the Federalists, they're worried about an issue 
which we don't trouble ourselves with over much today, but which was absolutely first on their mind. It was the question of whether or not you could have a viable political union which contained multiple states and working in harmony one to another. And what they had to do was to show that the way in which they conceived the problem of human nature led one to believe that you would get a better distribution of talent in government and a better set of political outcomes if you went for the extended republic instead of going for the small, warring, and conflictual elements that existed in individual states. So when you get to Federalist Three, you see the argument started. The first part of what we are told, in effect, is that the kinds of individuals who you're likely to get into governance will be better if you have the extended republic than if you have the local situation. And we're told that the mechanism which explains why this is the case is basically that of reputation. Individuals who have good reputations will be the kinds of persons who can gain support not only in the towns and cities from which they come, but also elsewhere throughout the entire Grand Republic. And hence, you would expect to see a better draw going to Washington than remaining in your local state capitals. This is an assumption which it seems to me is pretty dubious. It turns out that you can get scoundrels in both kinds of arenas, it seems to me, in very large numbers. And then they go on and they talk about in Federalist 10 the same problem. And it's really quite remarkable. That is, the first part of the document in Federalist 10 deals with the causes and the roots of fashion and gives a fairly powerful account of how individual self-interest can lead you to certain very kinds of destructive outcomes. And then Madison tells us quite right, there's, there's nothing you can do about the causes of these things. They are more or less spit in human nature. And he says you have to control the effects. But the only control that he's able to give us is again the extended republic and a model which says that by God, if you have all these factions contending in Washington, they will cancel out each other's influence. Now the first thing that one wants to state about this is that if you're looking at this thing rigorously, it's very clear that the answers that it gives have to be wrong. And the explanation is quite simple enough. It turns out that in order to figure out the way in which the selection processes are going to take place and the way in which politics is going to take place after selection occurs, is going to be heavily dependent not only upon the size of the republic, but upon all the other rules of the game which happen to govern in any particular situation. So you're going to have to worry about a minimum about the voting rules that takes place. You're going to have to worry about the question of who can control the agenda. You're going to have to worry about the distribution of strength, uh, various factions in government. You're going to have to ask all of these questions. And it may well turn out that with respect to some kinds of issues, you will get better answers on a national level. And with other kinds of issues, you'll get better answers at a local level. And probably there'll be a huge amount of indeterminacy. And yet you see nowhere in the Federalist, at least in the argument about Madison, of where it is all of these secondary considerations might come in and shift the power of advantage back to the people who are at some one of a local level. So having stated this, and it seems to me that it's pretty shaky, now then the question is, what do you do when it turns out to turn in your agenda into a situation of law? That is, we've got ourselves a view of human nature, we've committed ourselves to some form of an extended republic, and now what we have to do is to identify a document which will allow us to domesticate what it is that takes place inside this extended republic. And here I think that the, one of the great features about the Federalist Papers is its view of law, and this is closely related to its view of language. There is very little by way of deconstruction in the Federalist Papers. That is, if you actually read the document, it seems to me that there's almost no place in which they ask, well, on the one hand, this particular clause could mean one thing, and on the other hand, it could mean another thing, and that what we have to do is to wait for the unelected justices of the Supreme Court to give the imprimatur before it is we know whether we're buying this pig or that pig when we open up the particular poke that we happen to be given. Now, why is it that you have this? I think there are basically two reasons. One of them is political. The last thing that you could possibly do in order to sell a document to the public at large is to announce that all the major questions are left unresolved by the text. This is not a situation. <laughs> it's true. This is a situation in which you have to basically persuade people that there have been certain major problems of principles and that these have been resolved as a matter of theory, and that the theory and resolution has been resolved to the point where you know what you're getting by the way in which you look at the document. So that what happens in the Federalist Papers, and I find this very refreshing, is that virtually everything is clear, indeed it's over clear. 
You know, for example, that there is an executive, you know there's only one of them, you know there's a legislature, and you know there's a judicial branch. In addition, if you think a little bit harder, you will realize that there's no place for independent administrative agencies because that's not found in Article 1 or 2 or Article 3. You look in vain for Article 3A, you notice that it is not there. <laughs> And so you have now decided that all difficult questions of constitutional construction on a major 20th century issues have been resolved as easy as one, two, and three. These numbers happen to be Roman in form, but it seems to me that the article is more or less, I mean, the argument is the same. Well, this is the way, essentially, what they do. Their basic view about the situation is they're not dealing with um, individual rights. What they're dealing with is structural provisions, and when you're dealing with structural provisions, you get yourself into a form of matchless clarity. And one of the tip-offs that we know about this is when you start to look later on in the Federalist Papers towards the end, when Hamilton is worried about the question of whether or not we should have a Bill of Rights, and he asks whether or not liberty of the press is one of the things that ought to be included. And the argument he gives against the Bill of Rights is the indeterminacy argument. He says, once you put this thing in there, you'll never really be able to figure out what it means. And we do not want to have a constitutional provision whose basic structure is so radically different from the structural provisions that we can understand and on which we ought rightly to rely. And then once you take this particular view of the structural provisions as being the dominant force of the constitutional organization, something else starts to fall into place and becomes rather different from what we had thought before. And that's the question of judicial review. If you're thinking about judicial review with respect to structural provisions, and you've already put the indeterminacy argument to one side, then the question of judicial review is exactly what Justice Roberts said it was to be. You put the statute on one side of the table, you put the Constitution on the other, you decided that the Constitution was superior to the statute, and if it turned out that the two of them were in conflict, then the statute had to yield to the Constitution just as the delegatee had to yield to the principal. And there was nothing more complicated or difficult about the matter than that. And if, in fact, you do believe that this theory is a correct theory of constitutional interpretation, judicial review becomes much less problematic because there's so little room for arbitrary judgment. And one of the great ironies, I think, of modern constitutional interpretation, and on this point I'll end, is this. When the stuff came in in Marbury and Madison, it was this kind of a provision that ostensibly was at stake, although it turned out that the squaring was a good deal more complicated than one might have supposed. But that what's happened in the 20th century is that the Bill of Rights, which was no part of the original Constitution, has become the major source of difficulties in constitutional construction. And indeed, although all of us have our own views, myself included, as to what it means and how it ought to be construed and what ought to be the final outcome in a whole variety of cases, there is no doubt in my mind that if the initial question was whether or not you have judicial review in a First Amendment freedom of religion establishment clause case, the judges might have said no. It's in virtue of the fact that you had this powerful theory of language associated with the structural stuff which allowed you to go and take that particular route. So what is impressive about the Federalist Papers in, in the sum is that it really does serve two purposes. It is a remarkable political document of advocacy which is extraordinarily effective precisely because the advocacy is suppressed. But even after you get past that level, it does the thing which all great political philosophers have done in previous aids, and which unfortunately very few of them do today. That is, it starts from a view about the nature of man, carries it through to a future about the nature of institutions, and then follows it through with a, nature of, a view of the nature of language, so that when you start from beginning to end, you can put the entire thing together in the form of one harmonious whole. Thank you. Our final speaker on the philosophical foundations of the Federalist is Professor Marianne Glendon of the Harvard Law School. She also taught for many years across town at Boston College School of Law and has even visited with Richard at the University of Chicago. As you will know from her biography, she also has many awards, many fields, has won many honors, uh, and she was featured on the Bill Moyer Show. <laughs> Professor Glendon. <laughs> invited to be part of this panel, I was told that we were going to speak on the philosophical foundations of the Federalist, and I got all excited. And then I was told, of course, you only have 12 minutes to discuss that topic. So you can imagine my relief 
when it was narrowed down to only two aspects, namely the nature of man and the nature of law. But since I can only speak half as fast as Richard can, <laughs> I decided to narrow my own remarks down still further to just one aspect of the topic. And even further than that, to a discussion of two audacious critiques of the philosophical foundations of the Federalists that have appeared within the past couple of months. I'm referring to Francis Fukuyama's The End of History and the Last Man, and Thomas Pangle's less celebrated, but in many ways more interesting book, The Ennobling of Democracy. Since both of these political theorists contend that the authors of the Federalists neglect neglected or overlooked something important about human nature. And since both of them attribute the omission to a defect in the philosophical foundations of the Federalist, I thought it might be interesting to put their ideas in play. They're somewhat more controversial than what you'll hear from the three of us. And uh, to outline my own critique of their classical critiques of liberalism. Now, both Fukuyama and Pangle read the Federalist in a very similar way. That is, they see the Federalist Papers as accepting from the early modern political philosophers a certain image of man as a creature of fear and desire, appetite and aversion, who is able, through the exercise of the faculty of human reason, to get out of his precarious existence in the state of nature into civil society where he can establish that modicum of order that's necessary for liberty and security. And in that story, reason, the key to getting out of the state of nature, is understood in a very special way as self-interested calculation in the service of self-preservation. Now, here's what Fukuyama says about that image of the human person. He says that it led the authors of The Federalist to underestimate another aspect of human nature, which fre frequently outweighs material self-interest and is, for that very reason, a potent political force. This other part of the soul, as Fukuyama puts it, is thumus. Now, thumus is not a household word. It is not a gland. <laughs> Nor is it a kind of bottle. It is rather what Plato called spiritedness, and what Fukuyama, following his hero Hegel, calls the desire for recognition. There is good thumus, which is associated with sentiments of shame and honor, and is the source of many of our noblest acts. And there is bad thumus, which has been known to precipitate individuals and whole countries into the deepest of trouble. Fukuyama's criticism is that, because the authors of the Federalist regarded pride and ambition in such a negative light, they failed to harness the positive aspects of thumus to the service of the democratic experiment. And even worse, their contrivances to suppress and check the dangerous aspects of human nature increased the risk of producing a race of creatures like Nietzsche's last man, men without chests, fit only to be subjects rather than citizens. Now you may wonder what example he gives of this danger. And as it happens, he gives one, just one, those earnest young people trooping off to law and business school who anxiously fill out their resumes in hopes of maintaining the lifestyles to which they believe themselves entitled. For them, the liberal project of filling one's life with material acquisitions and safe sanction ambition appears to have worked all too well. Well, that's, Pan uh, that's Fukuyama. Now, <laughs> Pangle has a quite different complaint which is that the understanding of human nature in the Federalist overlooks the higher forms of desire, for example, the love of knowledge. And these higher forms of desire, he says, enable us to transcend individual and group bias. The oversight led the framers, he argues, to inadequately account for or provide for the absolutely crucial moral and educational foundations of civic Republican culture. Like Fukuyama, Pangle is concerned that institutions, structures, and laws that are designed as though people are a certain way will, over time, contribute to making people a certain way. So that, paradoxically, the culture that the founders helped to bring into being 
may have rendered it less likely that their descendants, namely us, would be virtuous citizen statesmen like themselves. Fewer George Washingtons, more hollow men. Now here's my critique of the critiques. First, and here I would find myself in agreement with Professors Brough and Epstein, the text of the Federalist itself casts doubt on both claims about what the authors neglected. It's true if you just read the Federalist and canvas the passages where human nature is discussed, you'll find some support for Fukuyama's thesis. Human nature is a mixture of base and virtuous elements. You can't count on the good parts, however, to come through in the clutch. It's because men aren't angels that we need government. But suppose we ask the kind of question of the text that Fukuyama and Pangle must have been taught to ask the text when they learned to read the Greeks. Namely, how does Publius present himself to his readers? And what qualities in the readers are the authors of the Federalist trying to appeal to in their effort to be persuasive? The answers to those questions, I suggest, disclose a kind of strange loop in the Federalist. That is, Publius keeps saying that people are so flawed that it's unrealistic to hope against hope that they'll rise to the occasion. But the ultimate success of his argument depends to a considerable degree on the will and ability of his readers to transcend the passions of the moment and to believe that Publius himself and the members of the convention were able to do that too. The Federalist is not just an appeal to reason over passion. It is also a shrewd appeal to a certain kind of passion. Much of its persuasive power comes precisely from the fact that it speaks directly to what Lincoln was later to call the better angels of our nature. There's a similar strange loop in the Federalist with respect to reason. The authors repeatedly express their lack of faith in the ability of human reason to master passion, but from beginning to end, they frame their arguments so as to appeal to the human capacity to do just that. Thus, contra Pangle, I would say the person in the Federalist is envisioned not just as a rational calculator, but as a knower and a chooser, the kind of person who is capable of establishing government through reflection and choice. Now, I would expect Fukuyama and Pangle, if they heard what I just said, to concede immediately two things. One is that the framers, with their classical educations, certainly knew about the higher forms of reason and desire. And second, that they may have strategically deployed that knowledge in their argumentation, in their advocacy. But the principal contention of these two classical critics of liberalism is that the framers did not sufficiently attend to these aspects of human nature in their design for government. Now, as to that branch of Fukuyama's critique, I must confess, I do not see, and he does not tell us, what the framers were supposed to have done to keep us all from turning into the civic equivalent of 90-pound weaklings. But I am not heartened by his apparent lament that Hegel was born too late to have inspired the framers. On the other hand, it's probably not a bad idea that there is at least one neo-right Hegelian on the American scene to balance the growing numbers of neo-left Hegelians that are presently in the legal academy. Marx's dictum that history repeats itself first as tragedy and then as farce comes to mind. <laughs> but no doubt that's because I'm not a Hegel scholar. As to Pangle, I would agree that the authors of the Federalists did take for granted the moral and educational foundations on which the success of their experiment depended but I do not think that they are to be faulted for doing so. Their design for government, especially the federal structure as they saw it, protected much free space within which they expected families, vital townships, churches, to serve as what Tocqueville later would call little schools for citizenship. It seems a bit unfair to say that the framers should have expended more effort on matters that must have seemed so much less urgent than their chief task at hand. Nevertheless, Pangle is right to remind us that we ignore at our peril the classical teachings that a republic must attend to the conditions, especially nurture and education, that are required to produce the kind of citizens that are capable of self-government. 
and even Fukuyama, in his mystical, borderline, Hegelian way, may be right that the remarkable advance of liberal democracy carries with it a kind of risk that it would have been an impossible luxury to contemplate a mere three years ago. The classical critique of liberalism performs a useful function as a kind of loyal opposition by pointing out the ways in which our deep assumptions about human nature may prevent us from asking important questions. But here's my bottom line. By directing their critiques toward the founders, Fukuyama and Tangle tend to obscure the fact that the political design described in the Federalist was an experiment. The authors of the Federalist were hardly oblivious of the changes that time might reap in their design. Madison, in fact, specifically acknowledged that Republican government requires a higher degree of civic virtue than any other form, and he specifically declined to pronounce on what might become of the democratic experiment with the passage of time and with increase in the size of the population. Responsibility for that passes from generation to generation. Thus, I can't help wishing that clever people like Fukuyama and Pangel would imitate Publius. And instead of visiting the sins of the sons upon the fathers, they would speak more directly to the political imaginations of their own contemporary men and women. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Glendon, and thanks to all of our panelists for those excellent presentations. Uh, and to our benefit, all of them stayed within their time limit, more or less, so that we have a, a, consider <laughs> a considerable period of time to ask questions and have an exchange. I think in fairness to the panelists, though, we should give them the first opportunity uh, to make any further remarks about their own addresses or what they noticed uh, in other remarks, you know, similarities, uh, contradictions, or synthesis. Well, I'm a little worried because, uh, do I push this button here? I think it's. Uh, because I was told that uh, the meetings of the Federalist Society were famous for controversy among the panelists. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, I, I'm not seeing this. But, uh, but let me say, uh, let me perhaps uh, initiate some of a mild sort. Uh, <laughs> as, as I understand it, my colleagues have both said that they see the Federalist Papers as a remarkably orderly and harmonious structure. We've even been given a, a beautiful image of how the parts might seem to be at odds with one another, but they, are, they aren't really. And uh, I just wonder whether that harmony could be said to exist with respect to our topic this evening, namely the philosophical foundations of the Federalists. It seems to me that uh, precisely what makes this subject of the nature of man and the nature of law so interesting and endlessly rewarding to discuss 200 years later is that one really can't find any philosophical consistency in the Federalists. These men were, as Richard said, they were statesmen, they were not philosophers, they were eclectic in their use of sources, so that you can find almost anything you are looking for. What people have, uh, Gary Wills has uh, said that there's a communitarian Federalist, if you uh, imagine what might have been in the library at Monticello when it burned down, uh, other people have found classical and biblical elements in the Federalist. I think one part of the philosophical foundation that is seldom mentioned, but that was terribly important, is the common law tradition as understood by Coke and not by Hobbes. So I would uh, say there is not this harmony in the Federalist if you're talking about the philosophical foundations as opposed to the design for government. I think it's the other way around. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm not completely, but, but one of the things about it is that you, know, you can always try to read back the current trends into ancient philosophers, and anybody who says that these guys were communitarians, I think, is engaged in a little bit of reverse wish fulfillment. They, they I think, had very little of that. Though. Well, the, the dominant element, I think, of them is that they basically were influenced by people like Locke and Hume and Smith, and the basic bottom line that they had, unlike Hobbes, 
is that what you had is a dominant pattern of individual self-interest subject with some form of a confined generosity. And what they were trying to do was to nurture the confined generosity in an effort to get themselves over what they knew to be a very extraordinary hump. The, big, the biggest problem that they faced was legitimacy, and of course the way in which they tried to do it was not to explain why they were authorized to do what they did, but to talk about the loftiness and the high purpose right up front in the first particular chapter, which sets the frame for the contradiction and the difficulties that both Marianne and I talked about quite independently, I might add, in our separate talks. The problems I think that they run into is that the structure which they designed was not equal to the task that they put forward. I'm not even worried about such things as the three-fifths rule and other kinds of excrescences like that. I'm worried about the fact that the basic idea that you could handle the constitutional problems by checks and balances, by jurisdictional limitations, and by enumerated powers is not going to be sufficient unto the day. Let me just give one illustration of something which they clearly left out for political reasons, which turned out to be the undoing of much of the early Constitution. That is the question of residual state power. Uh, there is the contracts clause, which they give relatively small shift to in, in Federalist 44. But for the most part, they don't treat the situations of the state as laboratories and little schoolhouses. They recognize them as powerful local monopolies. And they realize that it would be just enormously dangerous for anybody to be able to try to undo them. Because if they go too hard on that particular theme, then they will find out that they will lose whatever support that they hope to be able to get out of these constitutional conventions. And one of the great weaknesses of the, of the constitutional design, which led to the Civil War and the Reconstruction Amendments, was that there were insufficient federal limitations on state power, particularly after the contract scores were read to apply only retroactively. And I think that this can, can, can continue to build that up, and that they always played too much on what they thought they could achieve out of their jurisdictional stuff. And I think that they underestimated the loose ends that would otherwise exist. What happens? I think one of the fascinating things about the Federalist Papers is the extent to which we find mirrors for our own political philosophy there. I, I think especially to former times when, when you read old political philosophy, what you find exposed for you is the assumptions of that time. And what we find so difficult is to identify our own. I'm thinking of the period when the pluralists attacked the Federalist Papers saying, you know, Madison had it right in number 10 the Cuisinart will throw out good politics. Let's just let the interest groups uh, decide what the law ought to be. You don't need this stuff in, in 51. If Madison was right in number 10, that the political process will do, you don't need these silly checks and balances. Get out of the way and let uh, the Democrats in, in power take care of these things. That gets embarrassed, certainly by the time uh, the Nixon presidency melts down in a, in a rubble, in a rubble heap. The point is simply that the pluralists were reacting to the Federalist Papers and mining from the Federalist Papers things that responded to their own view of modern American life, and I think we all do that still. It seems to me that in the modern day, both so wide a, a spectrum as from the loosey-goosiest of the civic Republicans on the one side to some of the most hard-shelled law and economics types on the other can find plenty there to console them. So it's the richness that most attracts me to them, and part of that richness is in the view of human nature. And I must say that what most impresses me is all that for a first draft. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Who wants to lead off with the first question or comment? We can't see you, by the way. The light okay, so you're right. right. You have, have to, to shout. Stand up. Well, we have to talk to them. We might have to call on them. Uh, <laughs> uh, first of all, my compliments to the very apt remarks of the woman speaker. I hope to call you. Uh, Mary. I don't have the bio with you, but uh, very apt and nice. Thank you. Um, there were comments about the the way that the founders of the book was like looking at, at man as someone who was, was bad, and the other critics as not recognizing that man had these powerful aspirations for good, I would suggest that they were well aware of man's capacity for good and feared it perhaps more than his capacity for evil, recognized that there was a limited government particularly for that purpose, and felt that the engines, the things that your other two people wanted them to talk about and get government into the business of doing were precisely the things that they didn't want government in the business of doing, which was helping goodness, unchecked goodness, to get in the, in the process of government. That's right.
the, the question was, were the authors of the Federalist as worried about the innate goodness of men as they were about their innate uh, evil? Uh, and perhaps the checks and balances was to keep government limited and keep government from doing too much good or too much of what it perceived good. Is that a fair summary? And yeah. the question was directed to Mary Ann, I believe, first. Well, uh, there, there certainly is uh, much support in the text for that uh, point of view. Uh, I think it's Hamilton who says that uh, some of the noblest qualities of human nature are pride and ambition, but that's just what we have to keep under wraps. And Fukuyama's complaint is, yes, and they kept them so well under wraps that what they might have done is produce structures that uh, turn us all into um, rather spiritless, uh, egalitarian uh, consumers. But then the other point about it is there's nothing which says that you can't have independent movers outside of government structures who are going to engage in proselytization and moral discourse. And, and the terrible thing about it is at the moment the government gets involved in the debate on one side of the line or the other, it's impossible to have a free and open exchange because its coercive powers are so great. And so what happens is that goodness may adhere in the ideas, but the moment you adhere it in government articulation of their ideas, the authoritarian nature of the support becomes the thing which turns good ideas into propaganda. And I, I mean, I haven't read this Fukuyama book, and I think having heard Marianne's description of it, I'm not likely to take my shot at it. But uh, <laughs> even going through the through the preface, one of the things that's really quite extraordinary about this particular event is that you never could ask the guy, well, okay, let's just get down to butter. How do you come out on the minimum wage? And in total, <laughs> until you hear the answer to those particular questions, you can't figure out whether or not their own particular view of free market economics, uh, which I don't think is, is free or economics, um, uh, you, you really don't know whether or not what they regard to be good, I regard to be the most baleful influences of the welfare state. And therefore, under these circumstances, I think that the federal skepticism about this stuff was one which said that even in the area of ideas and sentiments, it turns out that uh, non-coercive mechanisms will yield better debates and more recent judgments than you would get from the center. And I, I don't think it's dominantly stressed in the Federalist Papers, because they were trying to articulate the, the various provisions and powers, but the whole obsession and, 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 and caution about jurisdiction is the dominant theme, I think is done because of a deep perception that if you don't set the boundaries correctly, then it turns out that the discourse that will follow is apt to go very far astray. A couple of quick points. One is, I think we're at some peril of judging good and evil by, or I think we're unable to avoid judging good and evil by our own frame of reference. And we need to keep in mind what Publius thought it to be. I, I mentioned the evils of such things as paper money. I feel glad when I have some. Uh, <laughs> Their thought was they were trying to build a government that would constrain collective enterprises that were affirmatively bad. They thought them bad for the nation, and the nation fairly speedily disagreed with that over the next decades. Uh, the other thought is simply that when we use in thinking of the Federalist Papers, even some of their repeated terms like ambition, and think of them as reported to be uh, pejoratives, keep in mind that very often writing so speedily, they would use the same term different ways, different places. They surely thought that love of fame was something that aided uh, civic virtue because then you would get, for example, a president who wanted history to care about what he was like. Your question? Yes. Yes, sir. Um, I was very interested in, in uh, Professor Glennon's last uh, line or two in her presentation, and I wonder if you might be willing to carry that a little bit further. I mean, if, if uh, Publius was uh, addressing uh, the Federalist Papers to us today, what would you think the task would be? I mean, because I, I don't know what you agree that we're 90 pound civic weaklings today. Uh, you see things like the decline in participation in elections, that kind of thing. I think a lot of people are worried about that. Could you just kind of carry that forward a little bit? Well, yeah, my, my uh, remarks in the last lines actually were addressed to the, well, let, let me say this. Uh, there is a kind of uh, loyal opposition to uh, liberalism that I think is represented by the classical critics 
uh, such as Fukuyama and Pangle, or by communitarian critics such as Michael Walzer. And when I say loyal opposition, I mean, as, as I understand the critique, it is not that they want to change the form of government, but they want to point out to us that liberalism does accept a series of assumptions that tend to block out other kinds of considerations that perhaps paradoxically liberalism needs in order to be the best that it can be. So my, my complaint in the last couple of lines was if Fukuyama and Pangle have a lot to tell us about what's wrong with liberalism, don't talk about the founding period. Talk about precisely the question you posed. What should we do right now? I, that, that's really my complaint with the, with the classical critique. Let's have some discussion about contemporary problems. But as, since you invite me to say a little bit about what I think, uh, it, it seems to me that um, the problem of moral and civic education that Pangle points out is a real one, and that it is acute for us in a way that the founders couldn't imagine. They just couldn't imagine it. That's why I think it's unfair to tax them with having neglected it. Uh, but it certainly, uh, to my mind, is one of our number one problems. But, uh, and it's aggravated by government. I mean, you just take one illustration, which I think exists in Texas, and I know exists in California. You just have an institution which requires a central state body to approve textbooks for the use in local schools. You invite the most incredible sorts of struggles over which books will be approved, what ideas have to be in there, what mix of history you have to cover, what particular slant that you have to take, and so forth. And I think, in effect, that if you could decentralize that particular situation, it would be a vast way to improve the civic dialogue rather than to um, rather than to, that, than to hurt it. That is, in effect, that the more and more that government takes on on the question of moral education, it turns out that the lowest common denominator tends to dominate the particular discourse. And one of the things that I find so extraordinary, I haven't read this book, but my sense is that they don't have any particular objections to what happened to the Constitution over the next 200 years. They sort of treat it as a changeless document, as if the Commerce Clause in 1810 was exactly the same as it is in 1991. And so what they are talking about the Federalist Paper as though the Supreme Court has made no additions and modifications to the original structure. And that also strikes me very odd. But again, in the stuff that I looked at when she was here, I didn't see any evidence that there might have been some judicial gloss on the original instrument. They just aren't interested in law. Oh, oh. <laughs> I can reveal who it is that, that Publius was talking to. He was talking to Bruce Ackerman. <laughs> Many of you are familiar with Ackerman's theory of constitutional moments, and he is taking something fairly direct from Publius with that, the thought that we have supreme moments in our national life when we hope that we sober will speak to we drunk for the future. Uh, that our best spirit will prevail and so on. I think that's throughout the papers. What would Publius say to us today? I, I think one thing he would say, echoes a point Richard was making, that he certainly would be surprised to see how much of what has happened to the document is not in amendments, only 26, uh, but in the thick pages of the constitutional law tome that I throw at my students. I do think that Publius was enough of all of them were enough interested in how things work that they'd ask us a fairly simple question. They'd say, you've been living with it. What do you think about how it's worked? Which parts have worked? We didn't know how advice and consent would work really. We didn't know how impeachment would work out. We put it in there and we made our best guesses about it all. What do you think? Which parts are working and which aren't? Have yourselves a constitutional moment. Uh, Ackerman no, you don't. Ackerman volunteers for Publius. Epstein will assassinate him. There we are in the debate. <laughs> at, the, uh, at the beginning of the evening, we ask everyone to move to the center of the room. Now we ask you to move to the sides if you have a question, because there, there are two mics and there's someone at a mic. This will allow everyone to hear. Oh, that's oh, great. Hey, we've had there's people here. Good morning. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> This will allow everyone to hear your question and will allow you to give the follow-up when the uh, panelists dodge your point. Yes, sir. I think each of the uh, panelists made uh, comments about uh, public virtue and private virtue, and I was wondering if each of the panelists could comment on the moral philosophy of the Federalist Papers, uh, specifically um, 
whether uh, moral judgments can be made and the, uh, uh, the knowledge basis to make moral judgments and how that compares to the uh, philosophical notions of moral autonomy that are at the basis of uh, the current uh, constitutional doctrine of uh, the right of privacy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> you you <laughs> That's the kind of question I feel free to ask my law students. Uh, <laughs> uh, just a, a thought or two on it. It does seem to me that they were very much the men of their times in, in two ways. What they were responding to, as I see them, were the major political philosophers that were part of their worldview. Uh, Locke very much, Montesquieu very much. Uh, these were people who believed pretty strongly in moral choice, both of them. Um, and it seems to me that the search that the Federalist Papers went on was in a way very much Montesquieu's, the search for the spirit of the laws. That Montesquieu had said that the, uh, a people's laws should reflect their genius. And I think that Publius was trying to say, this funny structure that we cobbled together that summer in Philadelphia does reflect the special genius of this people. That's quite an argument to have to make on the quick. Uh, and they certainly did an interesting uh, job. Um, should I go? Okay, I'll go. Um, yeah, Miriam. Uh, I think that, that basically they were clever enough to realize that the question that you answered has to be answered by question and avoidance. And, and the way it is is this. There are certain things about human nature which when you deal with them, it is appropriate to use force in order to constrain it. And there are certain activities of human nature for which the appropriate mechanism is going to be some form of social control. So that when you're dealing with the question of political order, the major issue you face is the problem posed by Hobbes. How do you prevent anarchy? How do you prevent individuals by using their own particular physical attributes in a way which will overwhelm their neighbors? Answering that question through union, even at the state level or at the national level, does not answer the question of how it is you live your own life within the sphere of rights that are guaranteed to you by the law. And that it, I think that all of them would say, simply because you're allowed to exercise whatever appetites you have, so long as you don't beat up your neighbor, it doesn't follow that you're going to be regarded by your fellow men and women as a worthy human being if you simply do not trespass against your neighbors and that they would have a second set of virtues, that is the traditional Aristotelian characteristics of honesty, courage, and so forth, which they thought would respond to right and wrong conduct, but for which the sanctions worked in a different kind of a coin. And the right of privacy, which you put upon it, is interesting in this particular context because it really falls astride the two areas. In many cases, you're not quite sure when you start to respect privacy of other individuals, you're engaged in one of the actions which is consistent with virtuous and proper behavior, or whether or not when it turns out that you don't respect the privacy of another individual, you've engaged in some form of a trespass. But be that as it may, I think the central point about this is that certain characteristics of human behavior are not to be responsive to legal compulsion, but are rather to be responsive to conscious and moral suasion. And the moment the society forgets that, by virtue of imposing the, the legal sanction, it turns out that what you do is you reduce the voluntary nature of the act and undercut in many ways its moral worth. So that I think, in effect, that the argument has to be that in order to develop a full series of individual mor morality and so forth, you must have a fairly limited government. Otherwise, it turns out that all you have is an on-off switch based upon legal compulsion, and what we really need is to have a much more modulated system in which interior sanctions of a much less formal and systematic nature, but nonetheless of great social importance, are allowed to operate. Well, I'd come at this a little bit differently and actually would start with, uh, again, the concept of the human person that the Federalists, the authors of the Federalists, seem to have accepted from Hobbes and Locke and Montesquieu, that person, in addition to being the creature of fear and desire, was also, in all of these early modern portrayals, solitary. And it seems to me that that notion of the human person as solitary by nature cast a very long shadow on the way we imagine such things as privacy today. One need only think, for example, of Brandeis's famous formulation of the right most cherished by civilized men 
is the right to be left alone. Now, the privacy right in the continental European systems that come from a similar early modern horizon, but with a slightly different conception of the human person, the human person is having a social dimension, think of the right of privacy as the right to the free unfolding of the personality in a social context. But, but uh, there are, you disagree. I thought. Uh, um, so I think you have to understand the right to be let alone in the context of the actual incident that gave Brandeis his, his views, which was there was a wedding that was going on at Samuel's Warrens. And it wasn't a question of the right to be solitary. By definition, even today, a wedding requires at least two and usually more. <laughs> and what, what he was concerned with is that there's certain social activities that people engage in in a voluntary relationship which should be kept in a private sphere. I don't think it was solitary in the Hobbesian sense of solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. It was rather that there was a domain which did not belong into the political, but belonged into the personal, and that we would all be better off if collectively we were left that way. And the reason I get very uneasy about the continental formulations is, of course, the moment you start talking about privacy as having to do with the unfolding, then you're starting to move into the domain of positive rights in which not only are you supposed to have the wedding left alone, but it may well have to be subsidized in some particular form <laughs> by various government activities. So that it's not as though I'm in favor of human non-fulfillment. I mean, that is not my campaign program today. But rather, it seems to me that you have to always worry about the question that the moment you start giving people support, you're taking from somebody else, and that unfortunately the subsidy which you praise requires the coercion which you ought to fear. And therefore, I prefer the Brandeis formulation to the continental one, which Mary Ann supports, precisely because it seems to me to let you keep the spheres distinct, and therefore to recognize that Aristotle ought to have his view on the matter of human virtue, even if Locke and Hobbes have their, have their view on the questions of political organization. Well, I hope you'll respond to that, yes. because uh, the, actually the, the reference, the particular formulation by Brandeis was not in, I'm not referring to the 1890 Law Review article, oh, but did. to the dissent in Olmsted. That was a wiretap in chance, wasn't it? But the point is, it, exactly, it oh. was. But the point is that these formulations matter. It didn't have to be formulated that way. Uh, and I would prefer, I, also I don't buy that if you think of the human person as having a social dimension, that you thereby buy into the Swedish welfare state. I don't, I don't think one that has to take all of those steps. It seems to me that, uh, we, agree on that. that we, could, we could go back to, say, Aristotle and think of the human person as a political animal who fulfills himself or herself in part through relationships with others in the family and in the holiday. That doesn't get us into a lot of well, trouble. And it might be better than having a notion of the most important right is the right to be let alone. I mean, to be let alone to form voluntary associations. Yes. The danger that I have with, it, with this reformulation is Whereas I, I do not put a very high value on my right to participate in politics, for the most part, what I genuinely fear is a duty that I might be required to participate in what I regard to be, in many cases, such a tawdry affair. I mean, the thought that there would be an obligation to vote for a presidential candidate, particularly in the present set of circumstances, <laughs> or to contribute some funds, or to spend my time holding a poster up there in which I can announce in four words that I want to get out of jail, free card, and monopoly. These are not the things that I want to do. And so again, what happens is my view about it is I'm in favor of rich, positive associations of an informal nature, but when it comes to the organization of the collective business of the state, what I like about the Federalist Papers is they understand that the moment you start to trench into the area of positive liberties, you're starting to deep in deep, deep trouble. And I think that that is one of the themes that's pretty consistent throughout this particular thing, and that's what lends it sort of philosophical force. Um, but which can well, you should answer. Yes. Well, oh, all right. Well, I'm we'll um, sir, sir, rebuttal here. Uh, just, just one point that I think we could agree on, that what is wonderful about the Federalist Papers is that they leave space for the social dimension of the human person and for the free forming of associations. 
We agree. And wasn't the authors of the Federalist, or Locke, Hobbes, and Montesquieu, that closed that up? I agree. Yes. <laughs> we have that everybody's in agreement. Let's see if we can provoke uh, some disagreement. No, uh, Professor Goldman, uh, in reference to uh, your statement about Yamaka, the, the, the Orient you were speaking of, <laughs> uh, it reminds me of the Iliad and the idea of hubris and arete. And in the Iliad, the difference between those two characteristics is not only the individual, because the gods that support the warrior, as an example, is not seen to the audience. Now, going on beyond that, when we talk about, or when you talk about um, the competing uh, elements of government and the checks and balances, it seems to me that it worked, or it theoretically works, when there is consensus about what the end of government is. And with that in view, and we talk about uh, our rights to privacy, we give up many rights in a war, and many, many people have died, and they've given up every right they had. And um, I think it's silly to talk about the right to privacy and any other kind of rights you may think you have when you have had that kind of price paid for this government, for this country. I think it's do you, do you have a response? I, I think the statement will just speak for itself and we'll go to the next question. Gary Lawson from Northwestern Law School. This question was actually prompted by Mary Ann Glendon's talk, but I'm going to address it to Richard. <laughs> sure, Hi. we agree now. <laughs> But so one, of, one of the classical questions about the nature of man, of course, is this degree of malleability. Mm -hmm. uh, do institutions merely channel human behavior, or do they both channel and alter, and if so, to what extent? And obviously, the kinds of political institutions and strategies you devise depend very heavily on your, on your answer to that question. Is it really obvious that there's a single distinctive answer that emerges from the Federalists? And do you have a distinctive answer of your own? Well, you know the answer to the last question, Gary, but the answer to the first question. <laughs> I may not have made up my mind yet, but my opinions are definite, is one of the things that I was like to say about that. Uh, on the first question, yes, I think that the, they, by and large, take the following view, which is that in a political discourse of this particular sort, it's enough to point out the nature of the evil without getting into endless controversies as to what its source is. Um, and so that therefore, to the extent that there is a nature-nurtured debate, I think that they skillfully pass it by. If I had to guess what they believed, I would think that they would agree with me, reading back into the past, which is, which is that whether you look at Locke or whether you look at Hobbes, that a huge portion of this turns out to be hard wire. Unfortunately, I don't believe that Madison was smart enough for that matter, Hamilton or Jay, to base it on the researches of Darwin, uh, simply because those took place some 80 years later. But I, but I think, in effect, the great question then turns out, the biological theories, when you make suitable allowances for theories of inclusive fitness, do point out to the kind of picture that of the kind of self-interest pictures that they do, and give only grudging allowance to the combined generosity, which is at the exit. I mean, Darwin is reported to have said it at one point, show me any action of benevolence in nature, and I will regard my theory as refuted, was meant to be a challenge which few have been able to meet. And even with respect to human beings, I think conscious capacity muddies the picture somewhat. But notwithstanding the fact that we have all these high-powered voluntary capabilities, we still have, in addition to our cerebrum, our cerebellum, we still have our autonomic nervous system, and as much as we know about the brain today, it seems pretty clear that huge portions of emotions are located in very specific centers, and what happens is it's not as though the higher powers eliminate the lower drives, it's rather that the two of them tend to work in conflict. So that I think that there is a lot of the hardwiring stuff in there, and that therefore the channeling hypothesis in many cases is better to the reformist hypothesis, particularly since the guy who's apt to be the reformist is somebody who's hardwired in the wrong way. <laughs> Me, 
that here's a point where once again we might uh, think about the very mixed view of human nature that the text displays. That, and I think on the malleability question, uh, although they don't address it directly so far as I know, they do demonstrate that they have some modest faith in education and educability. I was much struck by Professor Bruff's point that when they talked about virtue, they were thinking about themselves and their friends. And when they talked about the wickedness of human nature, they were talking about the masses. That might be true, but the transition from the wickedness of the masses to becoming like me and my friends must have been for them through education, just as the transition from man to men must have been through education. And I think when, when they reposed that faith in education, they were thinking not only of schooling, uh, what they left free to flourish in the open spaces, but the kind of education that Madison, at least, believed would take place through the new structures and institutions of government. That is, Madison says, he thinks that habit is the best teacher. And he thought that as we be practiced self-government, we would become public spirit. But it's oh. And let me stress again that uh, as the framers looked back on the ancient republics, they would often remark that their lives were nasty, brutish, and short. I think in some fair misreading of the history of the ancient republics sometimes. But that what they took from that lesson as they saw it was the need to try something new. And that in trying something new, I do think they made clear, perhaps just as a sales job, but I believe from other things that they really did think this, that the new institutions could aid the development of the kind of public virtue in which I think they really did believe. Uh, at one and the same time, like many of the rest of us, they could hold in their heads the thought that we were capable of virtue, but that maybe we should lock the doors. Yeah, I also think Madison is said to become very disillusioned after he was in the first and second term of Congress. That is, That's what Yeah, I mean, the first Congress was pretty good. By the time he got to the third, you were 80% down to the present level, which <laughs> It shows you just how quickly the decline can take place under these circumstances. And indeed, again, I, I'm going to be anti-collectivist on this point, too. I think that to have public institutions charged with public education will, in the long run, lead to public decline and public morals. And that what you have to recognize in education is that, in some sense, it is a solitary and private grappling with conscience and difficult problems and overcoming objections. And that in order to sort of make yourself virtuous, you can't sort of pretend that you're less hardwired than you are. You have to, to some extent, persuade yourself of the enormity of the challenge. And once you're aware of that particular challenge and of all the pitfalls that belie you, then maybe some degree of self-understanding and self-constraint will come. But the thought that this education is going to be easy, I think, has got to be wrong because the stuff that you're trying to, as it were, to reform, however slightly, is a pretty tough and pretty durable set of instincts. Yes, sir. To defend uh, uh, Fukuyama and Tango in a limited way. No. Uh, in a limited way. Um, Lincoln saw exactly the same problems in, in the original founding as I think that Fukuyama and Tango have pointed out. Uh, in, in his early addresses as a state legislator, he said two problems. Ambition has to be channeled into the government, into saving the government, and we need some focus for moral education and belief. And his solution to these problems were we need to found a political religion on all men are created equal. And while his main solution to this problem was that the rhetoric of the national government ought to lead people towards taking that as a political religion, and we ought to, at the state level and in private institutions and at the national level, refound our institutions to be based on this principle, but the national government had to take the lead. And starting with the Northwest Ordinance through the Missouri Compromise, that the national government had to take the lead to refound our institutions based on all men are created equal. And that that was going to be the start of our moral education. That government would set the, set the example, the national government taking the lead, and that the institutions would follow. Did, was Lincoln right? Did we found our institutions? And what was the problem with that? Do you, uh, are, is that addressed to all the panelists? Yes. Who wants Rough to start? Yeah, I mean, this, this is what happens when you're brought in from the bullpen. Yes, I mean, <laughs> whenever, there are two runners, whenever there are two runners on base, they ask you to try it again. 
Um, I think one reaction I would have to that is just that I think that it it's really a misreading of what I would view as the basic nature of American history of those years, that the treatment of the great problem of slavery, uh, the evolution of the Missouri Compromise, that sort of thing, or at least to me, the fumblings uh, of the government to deal with it and to temporize much of the time as best they could. It had to be done by the national government in so many ways because, among other important things, uh, organization of the territories was going to be designed in. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say that the, one of the things that you're, is so clear from the Constitution is that the organization of principles of government on general maxims alone was something about which they had detail, a, a good deal of distrust. They, they would rather put their faith in a jurisdictional limitation than in a moral proposition. You know, sometimes they got wrong. I mean, with the Commerce Clause, I think they had a pretty confident sense as to what they were keeping out of the scope of the federal government. But it turns out by the time it got to the mid-30s, all of that was passed. But I think that there was really very little effort on the part of any of these characters to believe in natural moral laws. Just to give you one piece of evidence, um, somebody proposed, maybe it was even Madison, that there'd be a national university which was run by the federal government as one of the original enumerated powers, which might have been a fount of such wisdom, and yet it was wisely, in my view, struck out of the original constitutional provision. So I think, in effect, that you know, to try to have your teachers and your governors as the same person is a generally a dangerous situation, and that that was one of the things that animated them. Or ask it this way. Think for a moment about the structure they created. Was it well designed the creation of a national government that could engage in Soviet style central planning? Or was it, in, and I think Richard would say, well, no. Uh, or was it instead designed for the science of muddling through? It seems to me that it was far more apt for the, uh, for the latter. Well, that's my point. They, Lincoln said that was wrong. And no. they had, that was the oh. wrong thing to do. Well, and well, they wanted to relook at it. We all agree with this on slavery, but the question is, is whether or not you do it on anything else. Marianne, do you want to respond to this? Yes, sir. In reaching this issue of the uh, philosophic foundation of the Federalist Papers, the larger issue that I'd like to raise is this. The panel has spent its time talking about the classical liberal tradition, Hobbes, Locke, uh, there's been a mention of Smith and Montesquieu, and certainly these individuals influenced the Federalist Papers and the document that the Federalist Paper was designed to defend, the Constitution, to great degree. The question after the panel is, is how much is this focus on the classical liberal tradition really an importation of a modern view of the individual as Adam, and not really a real exploration of what influenced philosophically the Federalists? And for example, it's clear from the convention, at least, and certainly the influences of Madison and Hamilton and Jay talk about classical Greek and Roman writers like Tacitus, Sallust, Thucydides, and Polybius in particular were influential. In particular from Polybius, the discussion of Lycurgus, the Spartan king, who embodied the, uh, the virtues of Republican government uh, that provides an example that motivated George Washington. And if we're really interested in looking at the nature of man that undergirds the conception of the Federalist Papers, is it fruitful to just focus on individuals that we view as being particularly pertinent to our age, Hobbes and Locke and so forth, and to ignore the classical Greek and Roman conception, not to mention Machiavelli's contribution in the discur discourses on Libby, for instance. I would never want to ignore those things of which I am not fully cognizant of the world. It is clear that sometimes that's the result that takes place. I, I think I would put the point the other way. One of the areas in which you do see some genuine discussion of the Greeks and the Romans is to talk about them as an effort to try and create various forms of the republic, the small republics, and to show how they failed. And indeed, I had the occasion recently to read Josephus and to discover that all that took place, it seemed, in the entire period of that history, was one person leading somebody else to death by defamation or by poisoning. Um, and, I, and I think that they were well aware of that, and they treated the, the, the sort of the, the situations turned sour in the, in, in the ancient periods as exemplars to be avoided. But I think in terms of the, the actual philosophical foundations as opposed to the historical illustrations, they were probably more tightly wed to the, the authors to whom you refer to, who were also, I might add, a, a not inconsiderable bunch of people to take into account. But there are huge numbers of references to the earlier period, and so I'm sure 
that it has a lot to do with their general thinking on this particular question. How it plays out, I, I must confess that I'm not really confident to answer. It seems to me the approach of a modern is, is confounded in many ways by the difficulty of identifying the difference between echoes and reliance. That is, you can look at Machiavelli, and if you look at him carefully, you'll see that he wasn't the cynic he was portrayed. He was a real Republican and had a lot of ideas that the framers could well have drawn from. Some scholars, for example, Pocock, have tried to draw that tie. I think that we have to be careful about doing it because sometimes you see what seems like the same concept somewhere in a discussion that might mention Machiavelli or a concept that seems Aristotelian in a discussion that mentions him and telling whether uh, its real reliance is, I think, a little difficult. On the individual collectivism point, um, I don't see in what I, notwithstanding what I just said, I don't see in what I can see about their selection of political philosophers to rely upon very much affinity uh, of them for the collectivists. Maybe I'm just saying that I, I don't think they were uh, anticipating or so. Well, uh, I'll repeat something that I said earlier, which is that uh, when, one dis when discussions of the philosophical foundations of the Federalists turn to genealogy, uh, they're endless and inconclusive just because of the fact that the sources upon which the authors drew were so eclectic, so that uh, I think uh, we've seen in recent years people make arguments with more or less plausibility for various of the Scottish Enlightenment, for classical influences, for biblical influences, for the common law influence. But uh, if, if one is looking for the primary influence, I find it hard to dispute that it is the new science of politics of Hobbes, Locke, and Machiavelli, and, well, in the framework of Machiavelli, Hobbes, Locke, and Montesquieu. But I think even as to them, we have to realize that these were people, the framers, who got much of their information through secondary sources, and chief among them, Blackstone, who garbled it quite a bit. And also with the classical and biblical influences, uh, there was a kind of mediating uh, carrier for them that was the concept of what it was not to be a man or a person, but to be a gentleman. A gentleman was a kind of uh, idea, it was a kind of melding of classical and biblical notions, Aristotle's ethics and biblical notions, that bore the same kind of relation to the original sources that my grandmother's New England cooking bore to its original ingredients. You can recognize them. They're still there, but they're very watered down. And so <laughs> there was the one person I think who was more important then than is now, Tom sort of wrote me this little note, was Harrington, whom um, I only learned about somewhere around 1985, who seems to have been a fairly important figure who's faded from view and whose influences perhaps were greater at that time than they were later. But I do think that in general, when you're trying to do influences, remote causes are improbable ones and immediate causes are more likely ones. And so that generally speaking, the effort to snatch the improbable and to make it the dominant cause is probably going to be misguided. Well, let me give one example of a precept that's run through uh, Republican thought from just about the beginning, as far as I can tell, and it makes this problem of attribution severe. Uh, I think Aristotle was the first person I could find, anyway, to say clearly, legislators ought to be subject to their own laws. Can you imagine if Congress would pay attention to that? <laughs> now that, that then runs through Republican thought and emerges squarely in the Federalist Papers, but you can tie it to any number of intermediate thinkers who knew their Aristotle, right? Um, so a lot of these things become of tremendously hybrid parentage and you can't be sure anymore where anything is flowing from and well, maybe it just doesn't matter. One echo, I'd like to, to echo what Richard said about Harrington, especially for separation of powers. I think, I think he has yet to be uh, sufficiently mined. Yes? This is another uh, philosophical underpinnings question. In thinking that the structure of government that they created would actually work, how much did the framers sort of rely and depend on 
a, uh, a belief in innate negative uh, rights and natural law and sort of a common foundation that these, uh, these would exist. How much did that contribute to making the structure work? I actually know the answer to that question. I, 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 I think that, that, that what happens is that that was regarded as state law stuff, and I don't think that their battle at the federal convention was with the common law, and that the major issues that they were worried about were the jurisdictional questions, those things which should be taken from the side and put back to the center. So that in dealing with the, the subject matter of the federal constitution, since it certainly is not a doctrine which grew up by custom and common practice, the way in which natural law went place, it really didn't have a place. That is, one of the, the kind of the nice oppositions about the constitution that, that I think is worth talking about is if you're a Hayekian or a Humean as I am, typically all of these dominant practices come by an accretion of trial and error, custom, and so forth. And the thought that you can get anything right by reflection and choice would be, I think, highly unlikely. So the question now you have to ask, why is it that they switch modes when it comes at the federal level instead of relying on the methods that were preferred by all the writers that they talked about? And I think the answer has to do with dealing with a different problem. All the discussions about the state of nature, which you find in the earlier writers, are about individuals who are trying to come together to form a state. But when you were dealing with the Constitution, you were dealing with states that had already been formed by individuals, which have pretty good internal constitutions, and you were trying to form a nation. And this entire shift in emphasis from individual to state, as opposed to states to comprehensive nature, tended to put the question of natural law to the background so it's relatively unimportant, and also required that you have design, reflection, and organization, because you could not rely on any system of spontaneous evolution to figure out how you're going to hammer out the compromise between the Virginia and the New Jersey plans for representation. Any disagreement with that or supplementation? Yes, sir. My question goes toward um, Professor Epstein's vision that he seems to offer, which is one of a government which like paves the roads and, and provides a police force, but which stays totally out of the realm of moral judgment. And I wonder if that doesn't ignore a facet of human nature, which is sort of a desire to be led, to be brought to higher ground. I think in terms of particularly like President Kennedy, President Wilson, who have offered that kind well, of Those are not examples I'd want to give. <laughs> <laughs> Well, regardless, regardless of whether you thought of the correctness of that vision, just they offered a program, they offered a moral vision, and people responded to it. And I think a large extent of what people fault leaders today is that they don't seem to stand for anything in a moral sense. So I wonder if you think that the government has any role to play in that area, and what are its limits, and what are the dangers? I mean, the phrase that they don't stand for anything, I think, is certainly true about the present administration. Um, <laughs> but I think that the difficulty is when it starts to stand for anything, it's not because it doesn't stand for anything in the question of moral judgment and so forth. I think indeed the one thing that keeps President Bush alive politically is that basically people regard him personally as a pretty decent guy, has this distinguished war record and a lot of other things. What they don't stand on is not right and wrong, it's on the question of what are the scopes and limits of governments and what is the distribution of powers that leave things to the central agencies, to, to markets, to charitable organizations and so forth, and that what's happened is all of that has been lost. When you get guys going forward saying, I have a vision, I'm going to lead my people forward, the man who made that the centerpiece of his campaign most recently was the the soon-to-be-late lamented governor of Florida of New Jersey, who announced in his particular campaign that people love an autocrat so long as he knows what he's doing, and then he promptly ripped the state asunder with the question of taxation and redistribution and education, and his approval rate managed to reach negative numbers two years after his original election. And so I don't think what people want is that kind of leadership. I think that people want somebody who has a strong moral vision which will tell you what the appropriate division is between collective and private choice. And when that is missing and everything becomes public choice, the truth of the matter is that nobody will be able to have a collective division, vision which will satisfy everybody. And indeed, I think is in the current situation that will satisfy anybody. It's the willingness to aggrandize these things into the public sector and then to deliver us the most grotesque form of pablum imaginable which turns out to be the source, I think, of so much of our modern moral and political decline. <laughs> Since we don't have an applause meter here, I assume <laughs> somebody else will be willing to comment. <laughs> Next question. 
Thank you. This gives me the opportunity to do what the other panelists just declined to do. I think that the, the question which all of you posed at the beginning is, is, is misconceived in looking for the, uh, the writers of the Federalist's uh, idea of, of human nature and the like, because they had a different task, which, as Professor Epstein said, was creating this uh, federal government. But at the state level, they were doing all the things which Professor Epstein just said they shouldn't be doing. That's to say, states' governments at that time were involved in all this regulation very intensely of things which he now says they shouldn't do. And the founders were leaving room for the states and the citizens of the states to do the very things which he's saying their conception of human nature at this new federal level said they shouldn't be doing, which may be true for the federal government, but was leaving room for the states to continue doing those things. So you're presenting a view of these people having a view of human nature for the federal government, which is not the same view of human nature they had for the state governments, which suggests that, to some extent, the whole process was rhetorical uh, when it comes to the human nature question, and that the question is wrongly asked, that say, what was their view of human nature in the Federalist Papers, because that's not at all what they were dealing with. Um, let me again give the answer that I gave before. I said that I thought that in terms of the human nature, they had a coherent theory, but they did not have a coherent design for the Constitution. What I expressly mentioned is that there were no federal limitations upon state power as part of the original design, and that the Reconstruction Amendments in part had to come forward to remedy, albeit imperfectly, that particular gap. So I agree with you perfectly. Now the question then is, why did they do this? And I think the answer was, and again, it's Federalist One. They knew there were a bunch of guys out there who had a lot of powers and emoluments, which would be necessarily carved down by this federal constitution, and they knew darn well that if they said that this position was to carry even further, they would never be able to get this thing passed at all. And so what they did in effect is they made the strategic judgment to talk about this stuff at the highest possible level of generality, and then to avoid the very awkward question of what was going on in the states. The only time that they relax that is when they actually talk about Article 1, Section 10, the Contracts Clause and similar provisions, where they say, if you look at what's going on in the state, the cheap money problems and the retroactive release of debtors from their obligations is one of the scandals of nature. And the reason they talk about that one selectively, as opposed to all the other forms of state regulation that's going on, is because they have to sell Article 1, Section 10 as part of this particular package, and therefore they have to give some particular explanation as to why it's going. And that's why this is not a philosophical document only. It is a philosophical, political document. I think we both agree with it. But what happens is that without too much of an enormous leap, we can figure out, if you strip out the politics, where the philosophy leads us. And that itself is, I think, is what accounts for the long-term ability. Just the way when you look at the original Constitution, it doesn't take an enormous genius to figure if you read out the three-fifths clause, it somehow or other seems to be a little bit more consistent with the basic principles of natural right philosophy or any kind of utilitarianism than it does with all of that stuff in there. But they had to do both tasks at one time, and I think the fact that they were able to navigate as far and as well as they did shows that they had both philosophical and practical wisdom. That's a... Uh an interpretation with which I completely agree, but I would point out that it's somewhat inconsistent with the vision of the Federalist Papers as entirely orderly and harmonious as to the design for government. Federal government. Well, even as to the federal and, government yeah. and, the, and the federal structure, which is a part of the design, uh, they expressly recognize this is an experiment, and I believe it's in the nature of the way they saw the experiment that certain parts were left undiscussed for strategic reasons, as you said, and also uh, because they just didn't know. Let me point out, what, when I said that remark about harmonious at the end, it was about the following point. It was, when you try to figure out the nature of man, they, I think, had this, this, this view that you better channel it to answer Gary Lawson's question again. They thought that jurisdictional limitations were the best way in which to channel it, and they recognized that, that those would only work if they were articulated in a very clear and precise fashion, so that necessarily committed them to a view of language about categorical distinctions and shock boxes, all this stuff which is so reviled mistakenly, in my view, by so much of modern constitutional linguistic policy scholarship. But the earlier point that I mentioned, I still think is correct, which is they did get the following thing wrong. They overestimated the extent to which you could rely on selection devices, reputation, and so forth. 
and cancellation devices in order to achieve the goal. So I think that it was harmonious design. I also think that there was a fundamental flaw in it, and that's why in takings and similar other works, I, I tend to be such a strong devotee of a fairly active intervention with respect to the Bill of Rights. But that doesn't mean that they weren't harmonious and coherent. It just means that they were erroneous on a very important particular. Is Madison himself, I think, came to recognize once he started to serve in the Congress and realized the kind of flotsam and jetsam that could be tossed up by any kind of electoral process. Richard, I think one of the last things you said was at jeopardy of uh, contradicting, I thought, a good earlier point you oh, made a few minutes before. Uh, when you said at the end that they did a rather bad job of guaranteeing the uh, hegemony of the elites and so on by leaving free the engines to, uh, well, to change the Jacksonian democracy by doing not much more than changing a few state statutes. It seems to me that one explanation for the failure of the framers to lock in elite control uh, is seen in what Richard said earlier, which is the need to get this thing passed. That you couldn't jolly well uh, put in a lot of things that would guarantee that and get it through. Uh, and so they were left with some of these fuzzy hopes uh, that the engine of representation would help. And maybe they really meant it, and maybe they really didn't. Uh, but I do think that we have to view the not only as a sales job, but one actively influenced by a basic problem in the generation of it, which was the need to build something that could sell. And let's just remember that Madison at the convention was ready to have a national government that could veto actions of the state, of the states. Uh, that isn't the way it sounds in federal school. No, and he, he backed up all the time. And indeed, one provision about elitism lasted until 1913, which was the non-direct election of senators, that is, through the state legislatures. But what happened is it turns out when the state legislatures got themselves into the cronyism problem that they, this so-called indirect form of election led to the kind of back scratching and office deals, which well, nobody was proud. And indeed, it was a reformist impulse, as I understand it, although perhaps a misguided one in some sense, which led to the direct election of senators later on. And this, by the way, had enormous implications, I'm convinced, for the structure of federalism, because when your senators were beholden to the state legislatures for re-election, the willingness to pass statutes which would really cramp down on state powers would, I think, be rather more limited than they are today when you could go directly to the people and say, look what my pork barrel can give to you. We have uh, run out of people at the mic, and we have a question. No. Uh, <laughs> one of the nice things about uh, being a judge is you just have to give the answers, and you're, nobody can. We don't have to hear motions for rehearing. So. <laughs> but if there's anybody in the center of the room who could not get to a mic, who has a non controversial question and a loud voice, uh, we'll take it now. There's one up there. All right, there's one final question. Yes, sir. Uh, in your constitutional law courses, do you require the reading of the federal I don't teach constitutional law largely because I don't know if I'd be allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's afraid of what he might find there. <laughs> Not in the documents in the Supreme Court cases. <laughs> the, uh, the answer is yes, depending on what's in the casebook I'm using this year. Uh, they all have, to some extent, uh, excerpts or quotes. And the worst problem with it is that the students encountered early in the year in con law at a time when its archaicisms only frustrate them. I teach a course called Foundations of Western Legal Thought, and we do read the Federalist Papers in that course. <laughs> Western legal thought that I hear? Western, yes, Western. As in John Wayne or? Glad for Fukuyama, she won't have to uh, abide that restriction. <laughs> thanks. Our sincere thanks to these very distinguished and thought provoking panelists and to those uh, in the audience who ask questions. Let's have one final round of applause for them.